Uh, the whole issue of liberty versus security, I think it has to be looked upon the, uh, against the backdrop of what's happened since September 11th. And I'd say the current threat right now that we see uh, emanating from the Middle East is a vivid reminder of how real and constant the threat is. And I'm only going into the foreign aspect of it is to put the domestic uh, part of it in, in, in context. We have a president who spent the last campaign and then most recently gave a speech in early May where he basically said our title had been decimated, implied the war against Islamic terrorism had been won, and that we could retreat to a pre-9-11 mindset, uh, saying that there would be uh, cable thugs around the world who give themselves an Islamic title. But the fact is that Al Qaeda had been decimated. Now, it's wrong for several reasons. One, it was uh, intellectually dishonest for him to say that. It was wrong to say it in the context of a campaign. It was wrong to say it in the context of a major speech. But the implications of that are, if you go before the American people and tell them basically the war is over, almost over, or Al Qaeda is on its last leg, then it makes it very hard to defend just one or two weeks later why the NSA program has expanded so much. Uh, when you want to get allies on our side saying how essential it is we stand firm against Islamic terrorism after the president says the war is almost over. And being in Congress, uh, I, I support the NSA program, we went to the nuances and details, but apart from whatever isolation streak may be in Congress, apart from whatever America, you know, uh, blame America first crowd that may be in Congress, I think one of the main reasons why we have a hard time maintaining support for programs such as the NSA is because the president is undercut us and mainly to speak in a schizophrenic way. Uh, and uh, he should be the one out there, uh, on national television, he should be the one out there, uh, instead of talking about phony scandals, he should be talking about the phony speeches that he's made about Islamic terrorism and tell us why, why the NSA program is so important. <laughs> so we're really up, up against a situation where the people who will be considered Republicans, the conservatives, the right of center people, are defending a program of a left of center president who refuses to defend it himself. But the country has to come first, and that's why I believe programs such as the NSA, we use that, I guess, as the basis for uh, today's program, is so essential. Let me just talk about the uh, uh, privacy versus security. Really, uh, unlike even the, uh, the communist menace of the 40s, and the 50s, and the 60s, we face an enemy which is overseas and right here in our own country. And it's an uh, enemy which uh, is willing to carry out attacks in our own country. During the Cold War, the Soviets were not going to do that. They knew that would mean all-out war. But because the enemy is asymmetric, it's not that easy for us just to respond. We can't blow up a country if we get attacked in Times Square. We have to uh, maintain as much of a uh, uh, security level as we can without infringing on civil liberties. Now, with the NSA, for instance, uh, let me just put it right up front. No American is having his phone calls listened to by the NSA. No American is having his emails looked out by the NSA. What the NSA does is collect metadata, which means the phone number to phone number of every call that's made, the time and the date. There's no names, no one's listening to the calls, all that information is stored. And let's put that in the context of what's happening today, because there is this threat, and I've seen the intelligence, and I know people always get burglars, I've seen the intelligence, and you knew what I knew. Now, I'm, I'm trying to say that basically everyone who has looked at this and analyzed it, this is, I think, the most uh, precise threat we've seen since, if not since uh, September 11th, certainly since 2006, when there was a liquid explosive plot coming out of London, which would have blown, blown up 10 airliners over the uh, Atlantic Ocean, which would have killed thousands and thousands of Americans. But this plot is very specific as to the enormity of the attack, the catastrophic nature of the attack that they want to carry out. And there are also a series of dates in there. Uh, but as far as the, uh, the credibility, of the sources, the quality of the intelligence, it is there more than any I've seen in the last 10 years. This is not connecting the dots. This is having two large blobs and connecting them. <clears throat> it's not that difficult to do. So, as we're looking to see if it's in the Middle East, that's why the embassy's been closed down. That we think could be the main focus of it, but it could also be worldwide. If they're talking about something, an attack of this magnitude, would it really change the direction of the world to blow up an embassy in the Middle East? or would it be more so if they simultaneously carried out attacks in Western Europe and the United States? So there's a, it's very, very essential we find out where this attack will be carried out. So let's assume, it's all hypothetical, but not really, uh, that we have <laughs> phone numbers coming from the Middle East. We, we, we'll get a phone number from the Middle East. We want to find out who that phone number has contacted in the U.S. And that is when the metadata would be used 
by the NSA. They will take that number from overseas and drill it down into these millions and millions of phone calls and phone numbers that they have stored. If you want to call it a lockbox, I know Al Gore gave lockbox a bad name back in the 2000 election when he was talking about social security, but these numbers are in a lockbox. And they drill down on those numbers and they will find if there's any number in the U.S. that's been contacted by that number overseas, then they can go to that number and then they call what's called a hop, then they go to the uh, phone numbers that that number has been in contact with here in the U.S. and to see what the background is, to see if there's any other uh, indicia of evidence involving any of those phone numbers and the individuals involved. That's the only time the NSA is allowed to go in to drill down on those numbers when there's probable cause or actually reasonable suspicion that is connected to an overseas plot. That's what happened with the subway bombing of Zazi in 2009. So from that, they can then see, hopefully, as one part of an overall schematic of uh, combating terror, who in this country could be involved in this current plot that we know is coming from overseas. That is the sum and substance of the NSA program. And I think it's wrong when we have people who are supposedly on the conservative side of the fence going on television saying the government is snooping, the government is spying, the government knows who I'm talking to, the government is following me everywhere I go, and they somehow attribute this to the NSA. The NSA is not the IRS. Let's make that clear. The NSA is not the IRS. I wouldn't for a moment give these powers to the IRS. But the fact is, the NSA is probably under more surveillance, which is ironic enough for surveillance program, under more surveillance than any other operation in our country today. It's watched on a regular, regular basis by the FISA court. And I'm inclined to agree with Weekly Stand. I don't think we need a FISA court. Uh, I think the President has the inherent power as Commander-in-Chief to carry out these operations. That's what President Bush claimed in the early 2000s. That's what the appeals courts have said. I think the reality is, though, we're going to have a FISA court, and we have to find ways to work with it. But in any event, it's monitored on a regular, regular basis, like 30-day reports, 90-day reports, six-month reports, by the uh, FISA court. For instance, if when they are tracking, the last year there's only 300 times where they had to drill down on numbers in the metadata. If by some reason they make a mistake and they put the wrong digit in, let's say they put 9972 instead of 9872, well they have to do a full report on that. They have to purge everything they got from the 9872 or the 9972, whichever it was, and file a report with the court just explaining that one uh, human error that was made. That's the type of scrutiny that is under. And my experience on the Intelligence Committee with the NSA was what we heard mainly over the last several years before any of this broke, because with all of the allegations that were made uh, about security over the last 12 years, uh, the, uh, the NSA hardly ever come up. You know, they were attacking Dick Cheney, attacking George Bush, attacking waterboarding, attacking FBI, attacking others. NSA had pretty much been unscathed in all this. The only time it really came up as a matter of debate in the Intelligence Committee was people from the NSA coming forward and saying what a rough time they were having with the FISA court, how hard it was for them to get court orders, how hard it was for them to be able to follow up on the information they were getting. This is not a rubber stamp. This is constantly scrutinized. It's also scrutinized by the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. Now, I realize going to the American people and saying, don't worry, Congress is keeping an eye on it for you, isn't exactly the vote of confidence. But I can tell you, the people on that committee, and believe it or not, uh, the people on the Intelligence Committee take it very seriously. Mike Rogers, the uh, chairman of the committee, is extremely conscientious. Uh, Judge Lupusberger is as well. And I can tell you that uh, this stuff is looked at very, very carefully. So I think we have to keep all this in mind that I don't see any significant violation of uh, civil liberties. I don't see any significant, uh, uh, to me, if we, if we have a balance, the thought of Ibn Zazi in 2009. Uh, Zazi and I, it's one of those far as go moments when you happen to be at a location and you become an eyewitness of history. I was at the Mayor Bloomberg's home uh, on Sunday night in September in 2009. He was entertaining the uh, Lord Mayor of uh, London and Salzburg was there, Rupert Murdoch was there, everyone, all these powerful people, even Tina Brown was there, that's right, how powerful they were. <laughs> and, uh, and I see uh, Ray Kelly. So I think, you know, two Irish guys, we're not going to be able to mingle out with all the, you know, the elite here, so we go over the corner and start talking. And he actually asked me to go out in the uh, street to talk with him. I, I was not aware until that moment of the Zazi attack, which was actually going to happen that night or the next day. And this is the only time I've ever seen Ray Kelly show concern, in that we knew Zazi was coming from Colorado, we didn't know who else, if we knew everyone else was involved in, uh, in New York in, in this, and this was a plot that would have killed hundreds if not thousands of people 
on the New York City subway system. And that plot was solved, stopped to a significant extent by the work that the NSA did. Did the NSA do it by itself? No. Yeah, it works with other part of the overall uh, mosaic, but it was a key component of it. And if it had not been for the NSA, we would not have known everyone involved in that plot. And we could have had hundreds if not thousands of people killed on the subway system in New York the next day. Now, I should say to you, when you balance out whatever violation of privacy there was, and I don't see it, basically tra tracing an overseas phone number to phone numbers that are on record here in the US, uh, the same information that happened in a phone book almost, uh, and, and that's on one side, and the other side of it is saving hundreds of people from being burned to death in subway tunnels. To me, that's a balance worth having. So, with that, why don't I, uh, I know John Stassi is going to come up here in a much more entertaining and uh, charismatic way, uh, give his side. We probably, we're not that far apart. We're going to try and start a fight just to make it interesting, but I think we're not, not that far apart. But in any event, let me just say that what's important here to realize, we have a real enemy that wants to kill us. It's an enemy that can strike in many places. This is not the core Al Qaeda of 2001, which is focused in the Afghan Pakistan border. This is an Al Qaeda, whether it's Al Shabaab, whether it's Boko Haram, whether it's Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, whether it's Al Qaeda in Iraq, whether it's Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, whether it's Al Qaeda, which is operating in Libya and Syria, under other names, Al Nusra in Syria. This is an enemy which is there and wants to destroy us, and we have to use every weapon at our disposal. And I believe that the balance we have struck is what we have to have. We can have changes, we can have nuances, but the underlying premise should be we are in the siege, and if we let our guard down for a moment, we can destroy it. Thank you very much.